Three, two, one. Hey, internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe and the Synergy Lifestyle Academy. And I've got a new friend online. We had a little bit of a challenge, but we did it. And her name is Asha. And last name is Terry. Are you there? I'm here. Hi, Brad. Hello. Hey, what, what part of uh, the world are you in? I'm actually on the East Coast. I'm in New York. Oh, New York. I love those people. They tell you like it is and do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, we do. I'm in the Midwest where they don't make a decision. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> out on the West Coast in California where they tell you what they're going to do, but that's not really what they're going to do. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> the philosophy of Brad here. Okay. So you're married and got kids and all that kind of stuff? I'm partnered. We don't have kids yet, but that's on the agenda. How about fur babies? No. Feathers? No. Pets. I'm, no. Mm -mm. Gills? <laughs> Before this it. whole quarantine, I wasn't home enough to watch pets, so I never got them. Exactly. This is one of the strangest times I've experienced in almost 63 years, that's for sure. It's just, yeah, it's the most unusual time for me, too. First time in my life. I think it's a good thing, kind of, because it's gotten people to do things that they normally wouldn't have done. You know, that it's forced them to try the online world and Things like Zoom have gotten very, very popular because of this. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We were using Zoom from the beginning, and now, yeah, it's transformed everything. Everyone's on Zoom all day. So as you know, it's, um, it's changed rapidly, and, and it's changing again. I just got an email from Zoom about more updates coming the end of the month. So Yeah, well, at least people know how to do it now, right? Yeah, exactly. So that can help your business a little bit instead of having spending part of your time educating people how to get online <laughs> you can yeah. spend the time with the real issues right very true very true so you're a life coach and life is like that's a broad category my wife is a shaman and life coach mm -hmm. and and also business coach and there's a lot of people that do different parts of life whether it be relationships or spirituality or finances or business what category do you fall into in the world of life coaching so two things I'm actually a certified life coach that my specialty was in spiritual life coaching when I began, but I've been focused mostly on relationships and wellness, mm -hmm. and I'm also a psychotherapist. So I have a private practice in psychotherapy, and I see clients for uh, different types of mental health disorders, but also stress, and life coaching is geared more towards groups that are looking to transform their lives, design a life that's worth living. So it's more relationships and lifestyle wellness as well. Yeah, you're talking specifically about like uh, relationships between people or like I get into relationships with yourself, relationships mm -hmm. with your business, relationships with your bank account, your relationships with your diet. Yeah, this is mostly intimate partner relationships. That's what most people come to me for in both sure. psychotherapy and in life coaching. So it's working on establishing healthy relationships or coupling people come in for couples counseling and couples coaching. See, that's so important, especially nowadays with this stuff where people are stuck at home and they're getting, starting to get each other's nerves and you got to be able to, wait a minute, that's not really what I meant when I said that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. And yeah, this is the time people have said either there will be a lot of breakups or you'll learn a lot of new things about your partner. And uh, people like yourself, I think it's uh, like I mentioned, my wife is a coach and so I've experienced it. And I think it's good to have some, a third party that can kind of step back and see what's going on between them, that situation. Because oftentimes when we're in our own world, kind of like the goldfish in the goldfish bowl, you know, you don't know anything other than the goldfish bowl. You get outside of it and someone like yourself can kind of go, have you thought about this? Right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, we try to highlight, you know, gently, but through open dialogue and gentle confrontation, some of the unconscious things that go on. Most people, I'm sure you know this already, are very unconscious of their motivation and their expectations. Um, basically, things that they've learned or adapted, but really haven't questioned. Mm -hmm. So my role is to help bring that unconscious to the forefront and as you stated so well to 
help them to become more curious. Like, is this really the way that you want to exist in your relationships? And if not, where do you think you got the idea from? You know, there's a lot of roles and expectations that people walk into relationships assuming about themselves and how the other person will function, but they don't often question, is that working or is that what you've decided or did that come from someplace else earlier in your life and what do you want to do about that? Right. The whole thing about it being like of subconscious or unconscious, I'm very aware of those, those situations. And, but, but if you, if you don't know that there's a situation, you don't know. It's like, I noticed that, you know how sometimes you use a paperclip to like, you unbend it and you'll pick it out and do stuff with the paperclip. I would bend it back because I didn't want to waste the paperclip. Mm -hmm. That's really scarcity mentality because I grew up in not a wealthy family. So, you know, you, you clean your plate and you, you don't waste. And I grew up with that kind of thing. So here I am. I'm okay. I can afford a paperclip now, but still bending that back because I'm concerned about it. It's, stuff, it's something yeah. that's in my consciousness. Right. It's early programming, something that, um, again, we don't often take a step back from and think about. Where does this start? How does this begin? And do I agree with it now? Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think it's very helpful to have someone to be able to point those things out. And like you said, in a caring way, rather than going, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, less contentious and more compassionate. I had another situation like I, w I was taught to put things back. You know, I go into the garage and my dad's tools. You always got to put the tools back. So I was taught to put things back. And mm -hmm. sometimes my wife doesn't do that kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there doing dishes or whatever. And I notice that the dish soap isn't put back. And all of a sudden I start doing the blame game. And then I look back, wait a minute. I didn't put that back. She's still in her office. She wasn't even out here. So it's that subconscious thing that starts getting you to think that way even though that wasn't even in the situation. <laughs> yeah, my colleague Brene Brown, she's a renowned um, social work researcher and speaker on shame and vulnerability. She talks all about that in her work online that we look for something, we scan a room and we think like something's wrong, something's missing, what happened? And then we next think who did it? So that's very much how people function in their relationships. They think, oh, something doesn't feel right, or, or this is not what I wanted. And so we start looking for things to identify and then who we blame. Most of the time, it's the other person. So it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy kind of thing. In the yeah, in a way, it can be. You know, we do things again, not because we intend to hurt others, but because we're so unconscious most times. So what kind of tools do you use? I know that my wife, which, what she does is she, she gets involved with essential oils and she does like meditations and she does dream work. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of different things that she does to get to what to, you know, to help the people. Like she's got a big toolbox full of stuff. Do you got a lot of different things that you use so like EFT tapping or anything like that? I do. Most of my work is based in mindfulness. So in my therapy practice, I do something called mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. But as a mindfulness practitioner, that is a practice of my lifestyle. So that's something I integrate into my coaching. And we do use essential oils, mostly because a lot of people that I work with have a lot of anxiety and trauma. And so it disrupts their sleep cycle. So we talk a lot about, you know, proper sleep hygiene and health and mental health hygiene, and some of that would include then helping them to create rituals around sleep. And so we sell essential oil and oil diffusers to help people to start getting into a deep REM sleep because that, of course, affects their mentality, how they think, their concentration, their focus, their clarity, and their mood. And so we start with, you know, assessing people's lifestyles. Um, and mindfulness is something that is still on the tongues of most people, but in terms of a practice, I think it's still something people are learning about. So I integrate that into all of the work that I do, especially with couples, because when you're so wrapped up in what you think is true and what you feel is right, we get flooded with a lot of emotions. And then as we said earlier, we make assumptions from those emotions. So I help people to, in the moment, pause a lot, stop, listen to what they've said. Sometimes that means me reflecting back what I've heard because people don't tend to listen as well as they'd like or think that they do. 
and then help them to, you know, examine what does this actually mean? What does this represent for you? And then that helps us to go back and forth with how we communicate and what we're communicating and what we would actually like to communicate better or differently. So mindfulness is one of the best tools I've found useful in every bit of work that I've done with people who have trauma or anxiety or depression or relationship stress. I can definitely see how the essential oil thing and just the whole olfactory system of how powerful it is. It can take someone from being super depressed and then all of a sudden you smell chocolate chip cookies and it brings you back to grandma when she used to make chocolate chip cookies for you and puts you in a good mood all of a sudden. So it's, it can be that powerful that fast. It, it can. And the, the mindfulness thing is in, interesting in that I, I'm not sure if I'm on the right track with it all, but it's really about being very... Um, like mindful, thoughtful of all the different elements that are happening. Cause there can be some little things that you're not really thinking about. You're almost ignoring that might be a small thing to you, but to the person you're talking with, it might be a big thing to them. Like I was, uh, I used to say this thing like, well, if you can tolerate me, just joking around, you know, maybe I was a little brat when I was a kid and that's hard to be tolerated, but I would joke around and say, well, if you can tolerate me. And mm -hmm. I said that once to a conversation with my wife, I was on the phone. This is before she's my wife, early on in a relationship. And I says, well, if you can tolerate me. And it got real quiet on the other end. Or wasn't, I was wondering, what the heck? And okay, I'll talk to you later. And I was driving on the freeway and I started thinking, something wasn't right there. Uh -huh. When you really think about it, what, what that person is thinking is, what is there that I might not be able to tolerate? They go right into the fear mode. Of, what is it? What is it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's small to me, but big to her, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Mindfulness helps us over time become much more alert to ourselves and thereby spontaneous. So using that as an example, in that moment, if there was something that struck her in practicing mindfulness, maybe she would have probed or been more curious to find out, well, what does that actually mean? Can you elaborate? You know, And that's something that I help people to do because Mindfulness is a non-judgmental moment-to-moment awareness. And we do this through our five senses. So a great example that I can come up with just thinking about last week, I had a couple session and it was really beautiful because the husband in the session was able to, just by a couple of questions that I probed with him, tell me his entire childhood story from beginning to when he graduated school and moved out of his parents home and it changed everything about his affect um the things that he forgot about that he really enjoyed about his childhood and his siblings and his neighborhood and the funny things about his parents and the way that they um had different belief systems and just to watch him time travel backwards um, it was really, I think, a beautiful witnessing of telling a story that we don't often give ourselves permission to sit with as to maybe explaining some of the things that we learn about ourselves um, and how we came to be. So using our five senses is really powerful, you know, whether it's a sense of smell or touch or taste or what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what you're looking at and how you're taking that in. And, and all those things, it's, it, I think it's a little props for you, the coaches, that they need, that they can ask those questions because the independent ind individual might go, you know, my dad used to take me to the park on Sundays and it was fun. But really, that's a big thing to them. And someone like you could probe into that and find out how important that really is because we tend to look at the dramatic stuff like, my dad grounded me for a weekend and he swatted me with a belt and I couldn't walk for weeks after that. That's the dramatic part. But the wonderful things is going to the park and playing baseball all the time. We kind of suppress that and it takes someone yeah. like you to bring that up and go, what about this? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Very cool. That feel just to be in your body all over again as a little boy. It's, it's quite phenomenal to witness. So do you have a, a book or ebook or anything like that that you offer people? I know that a lot of coaches have like a little gift or something to let them experience what you're all about before they dive in. Well, a couple of things. Yes, I actually have a book that's coming out. I'm so glad that um, 
it's in its first round of, of edits, so it'll be out very soon. Um, it's actually for millennials because I work a lot with millennial adults um, who are in relationships or seeking to be in relationships. Um, so I do have a book called Adulting as a Millennial, and that'll be out very soon. But I also give people workshops to down, I mean, excuse me, worksheets to download so that they can be prompted to get a little bit familiar with who I am and what I do. Um, and I try to remind people often on social media that we have a blog, so it's a great way to audit my work. I give a lot of anecdotal information there. Um, I leave some questions for people to think about. And so it drives a lot of energy to people connecting through the blog and expressing some of the things that they've um, overcome and then also taking away some coaching tips and then they book a session or a discovery call and get to know me a little bit better. And how do we get to that blog? <laughs> so you just go to Life Coach Asha, very simple. My first name, lifecoachasha.com. People could subscribe any day of the week and we usually drop a new blog every Tuesday. Um, and from there, you could also book a discovery call. And usually it's just a very simple, non-committed conversation. So people can talk with me one-on-one, -on -one, share their story a little bit, tell a little bit more about what they've um, been longing for. And then from there, we you know, set up another appointment and get a little bit more acquainted. And so it's a very easygoing process. It's not me pushing people to do something they don't know they want or are motivated for quite yet. But um, definitely go to the blog and learn a lot about some of the people I've worked with and their stories and a lot of the things that I've done to transform my life. Well, that's what I like about these videos like this where I can actually see you rather than looking at some hyped up video on you know, a sales video, download my free this. And you kind of, you're t hesitant of typing that in because you know that you're going to be sold with NLP practices on the other end. But exactly. I get to see you and see your beautiful face and I can get a feeling of trust and it'd be yeah. easy to enter that email address to, you know, sometimes people are scared on this internet thing. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think people should have a right to take their time and explore if it's a good fit because sometimes it's not. Sometimes you, right. like you just said, you think you see something that looks exciting or appealing and someone's trying hard to sell you a product or a service and then you start working with them. You're like, mm, I don't think that's quite right for me. I've said that a lot. Like you got two people that are really resonating good and then you find out that one is a Democrat and one's a Republican. All of a sudden, oh my God, we can't work together. <laughs> find out yeah. in advance because it takes some baby yeah. steps. Exactly. Well, Asha, I don't like to do these too long because people have that commodity of time. We try and keep them kind of tight so they get to know who you are and what you do. And I will then propagate this up, beam it out to the universe, and we'll get it out there. And if you could do the same, that's the synergy thing, one hand washing the other. Absolutely. So appreciate Thank taking you, the time. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. Wonderful.